How's it going, Eliminators? Today, I'm gonna to be using a new digital battery tester that I recently purchased, as well as explaining how HydroLock affects an engine, essentially preventing it from cranking over. So with that being said, let's get right into it. All right, so today in the shop, I have this older Craftsman riding mower here with a Briggs & Stratton single cylinder engine. My customer said she put a full tank of fuel in this thing last week. It started up and ran just fine, but this week when she went to start it, when she turned the key, the engine just simply wouldn't crank over. Now, when I say that the engine wouldn't crank over, my customer did clarify that when she turned the key on the ignition, the flywheel here on the engine did start to spin, but it spun very slowly. She said, check the battery and replace it if you need to. It just seems like the starter didn't have enough power to crank the engine over as fast as it normally does. So one of the first things that I do when a customer suspects there might be a bad battery in their riding lawnmower, well, I do a quick volt test and you guys can see 12.76. So this is a charged battery. And I just wanted to point out, it is a 185 cranking amp or a 150 cold cranking amp, which is a relatively smaller battery as far as amperage goes. However, for a single cylinder engine, such as the one that's equipped on this riding lawnmower here, that should be more than enough to turn over that engine. But doing a simple voltage test on a battery doesn't really give you a good indication of whether or not that battery is in a good healthy condition because batteries rely on the cranking amps in order to crank that engine over. So I do have a battery load tester here. This is a Moto Master, and it is what's referred to as like an analog. This is not digital. You basically just hook up the two terminals. You guys have seen me use this before, and then you press down on this button and it puts the battery through this large resistor here and basically simulates a load being put on the battery. And what you're gonna look for is to see where this needle goes. Normally, if it's around you know, 12 and a half or higher, Higher, it's going to drop down. Now there is a chart right here. We're looking specifically at the green here. It starts up at a thousand and goes to 200. Those are the cranking amps. So if you'll remember, we had a 185 cranking amp or 150 cold cranking amp. So at the temperature that we are now, that battery should show at least 185, but this battery load tester doesn't go below 200. So you kind of have to eyeball it where that 185 would be. And when I hooked this up and tested it, sure enough, it went right around to the weak area, but that told me that we likely had about 185 cranking amps on this battery. Now, one tool that I've recently purchased was this Foxwell BT-705 digital battery tester. This is on the more expensive side. There is a cheaper alternative, and I am planning on doing a full review video on this in the future, but you can hook this thing right up, and I'll walk you guys through the steps because it's super easy. We have put the battery under a load, so you guys can see that the battery is sitting at around 12.67, 12.68 volts. We're going to click OK, and we are going to be testing a 12 volt system because this is a 12 volt U1 battery. So we're going to click OK. There is no start or stop feature like new cars come equipped with. So you're just going to select regular and then we're always normally going to select out of vehicle because this isn't a car, we're testing a riding lawnmower. So you can click out of vehicle and you are going to have to select what post type the battery is. This is a top post battery because the terminals are on the top of the battery. So we're gonna go with top post and the battery type is going to have to be selected as well. There's regular AGM, which is absorbed glass mat or a gel battery. The battery we have here is a lead acid, commonly referred to as a regular battery here. Click OK. And then you're going to have to enter either the cranking amps or if you go up here, the cold cranking amps. I already have this set up. So we're going to go cranking amps. Remember, this is a 185. So when you click OK, you are going to have to enter that. In order to change the digits there, you can click individually to go one by one, or if you hold it, it will go faster. You just have to wait a second, but we can click on that and then it will take you through a full battery test. And you guys can see here that this is a good battery. Volts are 12.68. The measured cranking amps are 222 with a rating of 185. And then we could even go down to see what the resistance of the battery was, the state of health, and the state of charge. So this is 100% on both state of health and state of charge. 
So we know that this battery is good. By all intents and purposes, this battery should be able to crank that engine over. Now, I did mention that the Foxwell BT705 was on the expensive side. It did cost me around $200 Canadian. However, as I mentioned, there are cheaper alternatives. This one was a little more expensive because it has this button here, which is a Bluetooth printer button. So let's say I had to replace this battery, which I don't, but if I did, a customer is going to want proof. So instead of having to hook this tool up and run the test again in front of my customer to show them, I can click that button. It sends a Bluetooth copy of the battery report to my printer, and I can simply print out the battery test report and provide that with the invoice, and my customer will know exactly why I had to replace their battery. The $40 one here in Canada does not have that Bluetooth option, so if you guys aren't running a business like I am, and you don't really need to provide a paper proof copy to a customer of their battery report, then you really don't need to spend the money on this model. You can go with the cheaper one, which I can link in the description and the pinned comment down below. And I just wanted to show you guys what a bad battery would test like. So I actually had another 185 cranking amp or 150 cold cranking amp battery come in on a Cub Cadet CC30. Customer also needed a blade because he had bent his. You'll notice on the left of this image, the battery tester does say to replace the battery. And the reading of the cranking amps was only 47 cold cranking amps out of what should have been 150. And on the right side of the image, you guys will notice the much higher resistance levels as well as SOC or the state of charge being at 80%. So my customer did say that he charged the battery as much as he could, but the state of health or the SOH only registered at about 27%. So not only did we install a new blade on that customer's mower, but we also installed a new battery. And once again, I was able to provide the customer with a printed battery report with his invoice. So we've tested the battery. We know that that's good. And going by what my customer said, when we turn the key, the engine does crank over, but it cranks over very slowly. So we know that all of the safety switches are fine because the starter is engaging. We know that the key switch is okay. We know that the starter solenoid is okay. But what about the starter itself? Maybe a cable has a large buildup of corrosion and simply isn't providing the amps necessary to that starter. Well, do we dive in to an electrical diagnosis, which I do have a great in-depth video on. You guys can click on the top right of the screen to watch that video on a riding mower very similar to this one. Or do we start to look for some other things that could lead us in a different direction? Let's find out. Now, you might remember what I said at the beginning of the video. My customer said that she filled up her fuel tank. Now, her yard isn't very big, and when I shake the mower around here, you guys can see that the fuel level is way down there. I thought she filled this thing up. So where exactly did the fuel go? Well, as we start to look around the engine here, I'm noticing quite a bit of wetness around the bottom of the carburetor and the bottom of the cylinder head here. And as we come over to the other side of the mower here, you guys can see the same thing, a little bit of wetness down there and quite a bit of wetness around where the exhaust tubing here goes into the muffler. So the next thing we're going to do, we're going to pull the dipstick and check the oil level. So unscrewing the dipstick here, I'm pulling out the dipstick and right away guys, I smell a very strong odor of fuel. And I don't know if you guys can see it there, you would think that that's fresh oil, but that's actually fuel. So. Oil level is overfilled. We have a clear indication that fuel has leaked out of the carburetor and to the muffler here. My best guess, guys, is that we have a full hydro lock of the cylinder and that this is simply a leaky needle valve in the carburetor. Now, I normally have to explain this to my customer, you know, that it's not an electrical issue. So basically I'm gonna run you guys through the mechanics of this so that you guys will be able to diagnose one of these issues yourself. The first sign was low fuel in the fuel tank. Removing the dipstick again, I smell the odor of fuel and the oil level is overfilled. So now the oil has to be changed because the oil has now been diluted with fuel. So I basically have to explain that to the customer and they wanna know what I'm about to tell you. How does it work? 
how does the gasoline from the fuel tank get into the bottom end or the crankcase of this engine. So I'll walk you through it now. If you guys want to watch a great video that I have on how a carburetor works, you can click on the top right of your screen where I've linked to that video. There's a little plastic float inside of the bowl of the carburetor here. And when fuel from your fuel tank runs down the line through the fuel filter, into the fuel inlet here, it starts to fill the bowl with fuel, which raises the float. Now on that float is your needle valve. Some carburetors have a metal needle valve with a rubber seat. Other carburetors have a rubber tipped needle valve with a metal seat. Whichever you have, those needle valves can end up leaking, either due to debris getting stuck in between the needle and the seat, which can hang the needle open and allow all of the fuel, or most of it, to flow through your carburetor. The fuel that is basically flowing from your fuel tank into your bowl has nowhere else to go other than up the main jet into the barrel of the carburetor here. Now on a snowblower, they don't have an air filter, so you're not going to have this plastic elbow. It's basically just going to be open on the end of the carburetor. You may have a small metal screen to prevent large debris from getting sucked in. However, because it lacks that elbow, if you have a leaky needle valve on a snowblower, most of the time it's going to be a very easy diagnosis because you're gonna see as soon as you turn the fuel valve on or as soon as you put fuel into the fuel tank, gasoline is just gonna start pouring out of the carburetor. But again, because these riding mowers have this little elbow here, when the fuel level starts to rise and it comes out of the main jet and floods the barrel of the carburetor, it starts to fill this elbow here and it can't go up into the air filter, so it seeks the lowest point that it can go. And on this particular engine, you guys can see if we follow along, we have the intake manifold here, which leads directly into the cylinder of this engine. We also have what's referred to as a gravity-fed fuel system. So the fuel tank, you'll notice, is mounted higher than the carburetor on the engine. So when you fill the fuel tank up with fuel, gravity is what flows that fuel down into the carburetor. The more fuel you have, the more pressure you're going to have at the end of that line. Now, once that fuel starts to fill the cylinder, you would think that it would have nowhere to go. However, that fuel will eventually seep past the piston rings and then down into the bottom end or the crankcase of your engine, which is what starts to dilute your oil. So now you guys are kind of getting a picture of what's going to happen here. You go to turn your key. The key sends 12 volts down to the electromagnet in the starter solenoid, which makes a connection between battery positive and your starter. Your starter engages and begins to turn that flywheel over, trying to push the piston up to top dead center of the cylinder. However, there's likely lots of fuel in that cylinder and fluids cannot compress, basically making it impossible for that piston to go up any higher. It essentially seizes the engine solid when you're trying to rotate this flywheel in a clockwise direction. And this is commonly referred to as a hydrolock. So if I try to spin the flywheel in the clockwise direction, you guys are gonna see it just doesn't spin. However, if I spin it the opposite way, to pull the piston down in the cylinder while it rotates nice and freely. So once again, guys, this is going to be a simple fix. However, I now have to explain to my customer that it's not an electrical issue. I have to clean and rebuild the carburetor and install a new needle valve and then pressure test that carburetor to make sure that the new needle valve seals. We also have to do an oil change to get all of that fuel out of the crankcase of the engine and put some new oil in this engine. Additionally, one thing that I wanted to add was on a lot of the Honda engines, when they do have a leaky needle valve, sometimes replacing the needle valve just isn't enough to get them to seal up. I do have a video on how to polish the seat of one of those carburetors. If you guys are interested in watching that, you can also click in the top right of your screen to watch that video. It's a really good method, especially when you've already replaced a needle valve on a leaking carburetor and it just keeps leaking. You can actually go in there with a Q-tip and some polish and basically polish that seat to help increase the seal. It doesn't always work, but that's definitely fixed quite a few carburetors over the years. In some cases, you simply just have to replace the carburetor in its entirety, which is just one other thing that I sometimes have to explain to my customers, that not only did we change the oil, but we spent the time to clean and rebuild the original carburetor on the engine to find out that we simply couldn't get it to seal up 
and the only way forward is a replacement of the carburetor, which leads to more cost for the customer. You can remove the spark plug, and we're gonna have a look at this. Sure enough, you guys can see it's soaking wet with fuel, but this way it will relieve all of the pressure in the cylinder when the piston comes forward because we now have an escape port right there for all of the fuel to escape out. And with that spark plug now removed from the cylinder head, we can spin the flywheel around just fine. Again, in the clockwise rotation, which we couldn't do before because that fuel wouldn't compress in that cylinder there. So simple case of hydro lock, guys. I don't wanna spin the engine over with the starter because the oil is diluted with fuel and that doesn't make for a very good lubricant to lubricate the rotating assembly inside of that engine, such as the crankshaft main journals or the camshaft. I'm also going to be installing a fuel shutoff valve onto the fuel line there. It's an inline shutoff valve. That way when my customer's done cutting her grass, she can shut the fuel off. And in the event that the needle valve ever leaks in the future, or there is a little bit of debris that gets into that carburetor that hangs a needle valve open, the entire contents of the fuel tank will not drain out into the cylinder and dilute the oil again. It will just be whatever is in the fuel line from the fuel shutoff valve to the carburetor. So in a case like that, you might be able to catch it early enough if your engine starts to run rough and you notice a lot of black smoke coming out of the muffler, you might be able to shut off the inline fuel valve to cut the fuel flow to the carburetor and basically prevent the oil in your engine from being diluted with fuel. Well, that's gonna wrap up today's video. Like I said, links for the cheaper and the more expensive digital battery testers are going to be in the description as well as the pinned comment down below. So you guys can check those out if you'd like. But with that being said, if you guys enjoyed today's video, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You know, it really helps me out. You can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week. So be sure to stop on by next week, check channel for new content. And as always guys, thanks for watching.